We've been in Romans and we're continuing in the eighth chapter. I encourage you to find your way there. Romans chapter eight, we'll be looking at verses 31 through 39. And uh, on the front end, this will be a two-part message. I'm not gonna get through all of the implications of this text, but we'll be looking at part one, Romans chapter eight, verses 31 through 39. And if you have found your way there, would you join me as we stand together for the reading of God's holy, inerrant, and infallible word. Beginning in verse 31, the apostle Paul writes, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress, or persecution or famine, or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day we were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Verse 37, but in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray together. Our Father, we are humbled by this text, humbled by your love, grateful, moved, but help us, Father, to plumb deeper into our understanding of the love of God. Give us eyes to see this morning and ears to hear. Make our hearts fertile, like the parable of the sower and the seed that Jesus told. May the thorns and the thistles, the rocks, the weeds, the hardness, be dug up and removed, that your word, which is the seed, may bear fruit in us. We ask that your Holy Spirit, Father, would illuminate us to your word. We do pray for the one who preaches. His sins are many. We've not come to hear him but you. We ask, Father, again, that you would be glorified in this time. We have spoken to you through our prayers, through our songs, our hymns, our confessions of both sin and and faith, and now we come to that time for you to speak to us through your word, and we pray that you would do so powerfully, dynamically, transformatively. Um, Again, we pray that this morning we would not just be challenged, but leave here changed. Not just confronted, but leave here conformed to the image of him with whom we have to do, even Jesus. And it's in Christ's name we pray, Amen. You may be seated. Again, I'll remind you what we've been saying all along along for context. Paul is writing this epistle to the Roman church. A church in the first century Rome where persecution is beginning to unfold. A church that no apostle had ever been to despite Roman Catholic doctrine. Peter had never been there. Paul had never been there. There's no biblical record nor is there any historical record of any apostle having been there. The church was probably founded on the day of Pentecost when Acts 2 tells us that there were people from Rome who heard the gospel, believed, and returned home to Rome. And over the course of years, a church has come to be in the city of Rome. However, the apostle Paul has become aware that in this Roman church, divisions have arisen, divisions between Jewish believers and Gentile believers. And in the book of Romans, what Paul sets out to do is to speak to those divisions. And he does so specifically by dealing with universal truths, universal gospel truths. Gospel truths that are true not only for the Gentiles, but true for the Jews. Paul's intention is that these universal truths will unite them both. Romans 8 is a unique chapter in that the universal truths that Paul deals with are assurances. Assurances, things that every Christian, Jew, Gentile, then, today, you, I, must be and can be assured of. We've been looking at this chapter for quite a while, 
And we see that Paul really makes four great assurances. We've looked at three of them. The first was the assurance of life. That's spiritual and physical, eternal life. Chapter 8, verses 1 through 12. The second great assurance was the assurance of adoption, that God takes us as sinners separated from him and makes us his children. And he becomes our father. Same chapter, chapter 8, verses 12 through 17, the assurance of adoption. Last week, we looked at the third assurance, verses 18 through 30, the assurance of glorification, that God will ultimately glorify us. Christ will return, we will be raised, our bodies will be glorified, our will and affections will be glorified, we will be prepared by the work of God, the outpouring of the Spirit, to spend eternity in the presence of the Lord. This week we come to the final assurance. And it is the assurance really that seals all the previous assurances together. The text we just read, Romans 8, verses 31 through 39, the fourth and final assurance is the assurance of love. The assurance of love. On a personal note, as a pastor who truly deeply cares about each and every one of you, those people whom God has given me as an under-shepherd care of and responsibility for, I want you with all my heart to be assured of these things. So question, are you assured of these things? Are you assured of life? Are you assured of adoption? Are you assured of glorification? And are you assured of God's love? Because these assurances are intended to be transformative. They are life-changing assurances. They are pervasive. They are defining to our lives. Unlike any other thing, they weigh heavy on our hearts. And if these things are certain, and if these things are guaranteed by their very nature, they must change us. And I would suggest that if you're not changed by these things, then you're not assured of them. Remember what God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit has done, is doing, and will do, cannot possibly be ineffectual. You cannot truly believe these assurances and not be changed. You can't. You can't. And if you're not changed, then I would encourage you to Check out your assurance of these things. And by the way, this is not just my concern. It is clearly Paul's concern. Again, after articulating the assurance of life, adoption, and glorification for the last 30 verses, we've been here for a month, in our text, Paul slams on the brakes. Stop. Paul slams on the brakes, and he asks his readers including us, a question. Look at it, verse 31. What then, what then shall we say to these things? What then shall we say to these things? Shall we say, oh, those things are nice. That's cool. That's good to know. Great. Oh, but by the way, where are we going for lunch today kind of thing? What shall we say to these things? What shall we say to the assurance of eternal life? What shall we say to the assurance of adoption? What shall we say to the assurance of eternal glorification? What shall we say? Great? Cool? Glad to know? What are we to say about all of this? What are, what are we to take away from all of this? How are we to understand all of this? What are we supposed to believe as a result of all of this? And by the way, this is part of Paul's literary genre usage. Six times in Romans, Paul slams on the break and asks the same question. What shall we say? It appears in Romans 4.1, Romans 6.1, Romans 7.7, 7, Romans 8.31, Romans 9.14, Romans 9.30. Each time, Paul asks the same question. What are we to say? 
And each time he asks a question, it comes immediately after a, monu a monumental gospel truth. It's Paul way of, Paul's way of saying, listen, did you get what I just said? Do you understand what I'm saying? How does this affect you? So here in verse 31, chapter 8, what shall we say to these things? After articulating the assurance of life, adoption, glorification, what are we to say about these things? If you're lost for an answer, Paul gives one himself. And the answer he gives comes in the form of a fourth and final assurance. What are we to say about all this? God's assurance of life, adoption, glorification, what are we to say about all of this? Here's the answer. These things tell me that God loves me with a boundless, infinite, vast, extravagant, lavish, transcendent love. That's what I say about these things. In fact, if you write in your Bible, it is God's love for his own that ultimately is what Romans chapter 8 is all about loves us so much, life, adoption, glorification. Psalm 139, verse 17 and 18 says this, how precious also are your thoughts of me. Here's the psalmist asking God, God, how precious are your thoughts of me, O God? How vast is the sum of them? And the psalmist concludes, if I should count them, they would outnumber the sand of the world's seashores. Are you assured of that? In August, on Wednesday nights, Christian will take a break from Leviticus, and I'm going to do a four-part series on the English Puritans, their history and their heroes. Now, I've never taught on them. It's been in my craw, something I've longed to do. But in preparing for that, one of the people I'll deal with, one of the heroes, is a man by the name of John Owen. John Owen wrote a work called Communion with the Triune God, very profound work. And John Owen, in this work, encourages us Christians that we ought to be conscious of which member of the Trinity we're communing with in prayer, in worship. You know, How many times I've heard a well-meaning Christian Pray to God, God our Father, we just thank you. And somewhere later on in the prayer, they'll say something like this, and thank you for dying on the cross for me. By the way, God the Father did not die on the cross for you. That's when the triune God gets mixed up. We need to be conscious of which member of the triune God, though they are unified, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they're nonetheless extraordinarily distinct. And John Owen says this, that when we are in communion with God the Father, that the primary characteristic of God the Father, that we commune around, of all things, Owen says, is, get this, his love. His love. Most people don't think about God the Father in terms of love. They don't primarily think of God the Father as Love, they think of holiness, justice, wrath, omniscience, omnipresence, omnipotence, his sovereignty, his holiness. But do we primarily think of God the Father as love? We ought to. What's the most familiar verse in the New Testament? John 3, 16, what does it tell us? That God so what? Loved. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Maybe the most three familiar words in the New Testament are these. This is my multimedia. <laughs> We're high tech around here. And if you can't see it, it's just three words with one word emphasized. Can everybody see? Everybody see? What does it say all together? What does it say? God is love. God is love. It appears in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. 
Dios agape estén. Dios, God, agape, love, estén, which is a form of the verb to be. Theo, agape, estén. God is love. I highlighted the word is because it's really important. One of the ways that that form of the verb to be, is, can be translated as what we would call a copula, a copula. A copula is used when the subject, God, and the predicate, love, share the same identity. Copula, in that case, becomes equivalent to an equal sign. God equals love. That's a dangerous thing. That's a dangerous thing. For instance, I could say my wife is Debbie, or I could reverse it. Debbie is my wife. Or you could say Grace PCA is my church. My church is Grace PCA. But if you were to turn that is in John, 1 John 4, 8 into a copula, you know what you would be committing? Blasphemy. Why? Because even though God is love, love is not God. And yet, that's where our culture is. Our culture really believes that love is God. We desire Love, we pursue love, we need love, we seek love, we write about love, we sing about love, we meditate on love. All the while, we do these things ignoring God. We love love more than we love God. We pursue love more than pursuing God. We need love more than we need God. And frankly, it's blasphemy and it's idolatry. Our culture is in love with the notion of love rather than being in love with the person of God. When John in 1 John 4, 8 says God is love, he's using a literary device. He is saying that God is so characterized by love, so intensely loving, so perfectly loving, it is that God is as love itself, not a copia. Again, look at Romans 8.31. What shall we say to these things? Life, adoption, glorification. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who's against us? If God loves us like this, then what in the world do we have to fear? If God loves us like this, why do I worry, fear, fret, Do you believe that God loves us like this? Do you believe that this is true? And if it is true, and it is, then conversely, listen to me carefully, and I say this pastorally because I care. Fear, fret, anxiety, worry, anxiousness are really, frankly, all manifestations of not being assured of God's love. You struggle, do you struggle, do you struggle, do you struggle, do you struggle? Why do you struggle? If you're a Christian, it's because you're not assured of God's love. And if you do struggle with these kind of things, as a pastor, let me say to you, at least you know where the battle is. And you leave here knowing what you're up against. The assurance of the love of God. And again, I want you to be assured. Paul certainly wants you to be assured. But more than anything else, most of all, God wants you to be assured of his love. Over and over throughout the Old Testament, the repeated refrain comes and comes again. God saying, fear not, for I am what? With you. 1 John 4.18, anybody know what it says? I'll lead you. Perfect love Cast out all what? 
all fear. 2 Timothy 1.7, for God has not given us a spirit of intimidity, no, but of power and love and discipline. Essentially, Paul moves on from this question to say, what are you worried about? What are you worried about? And I remind you in context of Romans when it was written, written around A.D. 57, 58, just years earlier, the Roman Emperor Claudius had begun persecuting the Jews and Christians. In that Roman world, Jews and Christians were indistinguishable to the Romans. They were all just them. In 49 A.D., Jews and Christians were expelled, forced out of Rome. The flames of Roman persecution were being flamed. And within a few years, the church would meet an emperor by the name of, get this, Nero. And there's a reason why verse 35, look at it, mentions, as he talks about love, mentions things like tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, and sword, because they're about to become reality. And to those first century Christians, and now us, 21st century Christians, Paul asks, because of the extravagant love of God, what are you worried about? If you're looking at the text, and I love, I'm a Bible teacher more than a theologian. Christian's really a theologian. I'm, I'm really a Bible teacher. And I love the text. I love the word. And I'm going to point this out to you, that what Paul does to answer this question, what are you worried about, is he answers the question by asking seven rhetorical questions himself. Seven questions that Paul asks, and he asks them, in order to make a point rather than to solicit an answer. He's not looking for an answer. He's making a point through the use of rhetorical questions. Look at your Bible, seven questions, rapid fire. Verse 31, what shall we say to these things? Number two, verse 31, if God is for us, who can be against us? Number three, verse 32, he did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all. How will he not also with him freely give us all things? Question mark. Or number four, verse 33, who will bring a charge against God's elect? Question mark. Or number five, verse 33b and 34a, God is the one who justified. Who is the one who condemns? Question mark. Or number six, verse 35a, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Question mark. Or number seven, verse 35b, will tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword? Question mark. He's not looking for answers. He's making a point. He's making a point. This is how much God loves us. And Paul is not denying, obviously, in these verses, the hardships of life. But what Paul is saying is that despite the hardships of life, God's great love for us will ultimately prevail. And you can be assured of that. As Christians, we can be assured that through it all, whatever a lifetime brings, we can be assured of life. We can be assured of adoption. We can be assured of glorification. We can be assured of God's love. If you were to go back to verse 18, same chapter, remember when Paul says this? He says, for I consider the sufferings of this present time that they are not worthy to be compared with the glory that's be revealed to us. Not denying hardships, but saying despite hardships, God's love for us will prevail. At this point, you might be asking the question, well, how much does God love us? Paul answers it. He knows the question that's in your mind. Verse 32, here's the answer. How much does God love us? Well, he who did not spare his own son, but freely delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? That's how much God loves us. And Paul's argument in verse 32 concerning how much God loves us is an argument from the greater to the least. Verse 32, he who did not spare his own son but delivered him over for us all, that's the greater. Verse 32, B, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? That's the lesser. If he loves us to the greater degree, we can assume the lesser degree. If God gave a son, he'll certainly take care of us. 
The Puritan John Flavel said this, Surely if he would not spare his own son one stroke, one tear, one groan, one sigh, one circumstance of misery, it can never be imagined that he should, after this, deny or withhold from his people. For whose sake all this was suffered or comforts or any privilege, spiritual or temporal, end quote. How much does God love us? He did not spare his own son. If you look at verse 32, you see the word spare there. In the Greek, it's the word phidomai, and it means that God did not hold back the idea of God didn't have any limits, he didn't have a ceiling, he didn't have some maximum, no boundaries, no restraints. God gave us all. In the Septuagint, which is the Greek version of the Old Testament, the very phidomai is used concerning Abraham who spared not his own son Isaac. Remember that scene? And when we think about God not sparing his own son, we need to understand it as the single most costly, sacrificial, extravagant act ever. It was a demonstration by God that his love was so great that no price was too high. And not only did he not spare his son, but notice verse 32, he also delivered him over. He handed over his only son. Used in John 18, 5 of Judas, handing over Jesus. Matthew 27, 2 of the Jewish leaders, delivering Jesus to Pilate. Acts 3, 13 of, the Jew, of Jerusalem, delivering up Jesus. And even of Pilate, delivering Jesus to death. Mark 15, 15. God didn't spare. No cost was too great. And in not sparing, God delivered Jesus over himself. Um. And really, and so importantly, in order to understand the cross properly, we need to know that the cross was the result of God himself not sparing his son and God himself delivering over his son. Jesus wasn't a victim. Jesus didn't get caught up in a movement. Uh, I grew up in the era when God's spell took place. That was its mode. Jesus made a mistake, went further than he thought it would. Same with Jesus Christ, Superstar, the opera, if you remember that. The book that was a million seller, the Passover plot. All of these tried to portray Jesus as a victim somehow. But the scripture, the New Testament is clear. God gave over his son. Many of us are familiar with Isaiah 53, the prophecy, greatest Old Testament prophecy on the death of Christ. Isaiah 53, it's only 12 verses. You know what Isaiah 53 reminds us? At the beginning, and at the middle, and at the end. Incrementally, throughout Isaiah 53, we're reminded of something, and that is the cause of Jesus' death, which is the Father. Isaiah 53, and I'll emphasize my voice, surely our griefs he himself bore, our sorrows he carried, yet we esteemed him stricken. He was, listen to this, smitten of God and afflicted. Who smote him? Who afflicted him? God. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. Listen, but... The Lord, the Lord God has caused the iniquity of us to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. He did not open his mouth like a lamb that has led to slaughter, like a sheep that is silent before his shears, so he did not open his mouth by oppression and judgment. He was taken away, and as for his generation, that is, the people who were living in this time, who considered that God was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people? No one considered to whom the stroke was due. His grave was aside and with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. But, here it is, but the Lord, God, was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. Peter reaffirms this <coughs> In the beginning of the church age in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost preaching, he says, this man, Jesus, listen to this, 
was delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. God gave his son. God delivered over his son. God spared not his son. How much does God love me? I was thinking back, there was an era, many of you are too young to remember this, but they used to, it certainly you know, back in the 70s, they used to make these little silly statues that you could buy in drugstores. Little kids, kind of all beige. I bought one for my mom for Mother's Day one year. On the bottom it said, how much, uh, this is how much I love you. And it showed a little kid like this, right? Remember those, anybody? Don't tell me I'm the oldest person in the room. I can't possibly be. I love you this much. Well, that's the truth. That is the truth. How much does God love me? We look at the cross and see Jesus hanging. I love you this much. This much. The love of God. I just know we're going to get into deep water right now, but I have to point it out to you. One of the most amazing things about God's love is God's love is specific. If you're a Christian today, let me say this to you. God loves you. You. Notice verse 26. And I want you to notice pronouns. In the same way, verse 26, the Spirit also helps, what's it say? Our weakness. For here it is again, we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes, here it is, for us with groanings too deep for words. Verse 29, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined, conformed to the image of Son, that he would be the firstborn among many brothers. Verse 30, and these whom he predestined, he also called, and these whom he called, he also justified, and these whom he justified, he also glorified. Verse 31, and what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who's against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Verse 37, but in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us, for I'm convinced that neither death nor life, angels, principalities, things present, things to come, powers, heights, depths, any other created thing will be able to separate us. Huh. Us. From the love of God, which is Christ Jesus, our Lord. Question. Who's the us? Who's the these? Who's the we? You know, the text actually tells us. I didn't write this. This isn't John's word. This is God's word. Look at verse 33. Who will bring a charge against, what's it say? God's elect. Who's the us? God's elect. Who's the these? God's elect. Who's the us? God's elect. You do realize, I mean, it should be self-evident, that the unbeliever, the unbeliever has no assurance of life. The unbeliever has no assurance of adoption. The unbeliever has no assurance of eternal glorification and ultimately has no assurance of God's lavish, saving, keeping love. God's elect. John 6, 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, Jesus says, I will not cast out. God's sovereign, saving love. And again, what comes after Romans 8, Romans 9, I'm prepping you. It's coming. I didn't create the doctrine of election. I didn't create the doctrine of predestination. I, like probably everyone in this room, struggled with it, fought against it, didn't seem logical, but you know what? Thus saith the Lord. John 17, 1 and 2, Jesus spoke these things, lifting his eyes to heaven, said, Father, the hour has come, glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, even as you gave him authority over all flesh. Yet, 
that all whom you give me may have eternal life. I've got authority over the world. It's not a question of authority over all. It's a question of whom hast thou given me? John 10, 14 through 16, I am the good shepherd and I know my own. And my own, get this, know me. Even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, I lay down my life for my sheep. And he says, I have other sheep. He's talking to Jews, I have other sheep, talking about Gentile sheep, which are not of this fold, Israel. But I must bring them also. And they will also hear my voice. And they will become one flock under one shepherd. My own. My own. Ephesians 5, 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the, anybody know next word? Church. And gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, no spot, no wrinkle, any such thing, that she would be holy and blameless. Ephesians 1, 3 through 5, blessed be the God and Father who has blessed us, there it is again, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places of Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons according to the kind intention of his will. If you're a biblically committed Christian, you must have some doctrine of predestination and election. Why? I'll tell you why, because it's everywhere. It's everywhere. And you can wrestle with all the nuances, say it doesn't sound fair, or did it, why me, why not them? I get it. I get it. But like Jacob and Peniel wrestling with God, at some point you're going to roll over and say, Uncle, I give up. For the Apostle Paul, this doctrine, the sovereign love of God, always leads to doxology. He, he doesn't worry about those who cringe at it, revolt against it, dismiss it, or hate it. For him, it leads him to worship and praise, to humble gratitude. It's how we rightly understand God's love for us. Jesus 15, 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you. God chose to love us. Jesus chose to die for us. And I think it's sort of like adopted children who one day grow old enough to look back and realize that my mom and dad chose to love me. I didn't choose them. They chose me. Or like a married couple who looks back on their wedding day and reflects on the fact that Hey, you know what? You and I, we specifically chose to love each other and commit our lives to each other for a lifetime. Each other. Uh, look at verse 32. It says this, He who did not spare his own son. He who did not spare his own son. I'm going to get a little deep in the weeds right now, but I think you'll get it. When you look at those words, the beginning of verse 32, he did not spare his own son. Unfortunately, most translations, including my NAS, leaves out a small Greek part participle. Uh, early in my theological education, uh, you're introduced to what we call the bag. The bag. The bag refers to, here's the official title, the Greek and English lexicon of the New Testament and other early Christian literature by Bauer, Art, Gingrich, and Danker. That's why it's called the bag. Big title reduced to the bag. The Greek, English, lexicon, the New Testament, other early Christian literature. And the bag deals with this untranslated participle in Romans 8.32. And it deals with it by adding one word that's not in most of our translations, unfortunately. And that word comes between the word spare and the word his. Again, who did not spare his own son. Between the word spare and the word his, the bag adds this one participle, and it is the word, here it is, even. Even. Literally, the text says, who did not spare even his own son. 
And the idea is the extent of God's love. Even his own son for his elect. Look with me, if you would, and I'll close with this promise. Look with me at 1 John chapter 4. If you're looking for a short memory verse this year, this is a good one. It's not very ambitious, but it's a good one. 1 John chapter 4, notice verse 19. Do you know this? Are you familiar with this verse? What's it say? We love because he first loved us. We love because he first loved us. Is that foreign to you? How about the hymn, Oh, How I Love Jesus? Remember it? There's a name I love to hear. I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Here's the refrain. Sing it with me. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love. Get ready for it. Why? What? What did I just sing the doctrine of election? (laughs) Did he really first love me? And the reason I love him is because he first loved me. I got my grandkids this week for the next couple weeks. It typically goes like this, right? Edison, why'd you hit Sam? Because Sam first hit me. (laughs) Reciprocity. Do you understand what that verse says? We love him because he first loved us. Do you see the crime? Do you see the crime? What is the foremost great commandment? Thou shall what? Love the Lord thy God. Do you realize that verse, verse 19, tells us there was a time when we didn't love him. And it took God loving us and the transforming power in his love to make us, cause us, to change our nature and hearts so that we would love him in return. We love because he first loved us. Let's pray together. Our God and our Father, we are grateful for Your love, while we were still dead in our sins, Christ died for us. While we were still dead in our sins, you loved us. You're saving, elective, calling, regenerating, love. Called us to yourself. Made us aware of your love. Opened the dark pitch of our hearts, the blindness of our eyes to first comprehend and behold the indescribable love of God for us. Greater than the sands of the seashores of the world. (laughs) What are we worrying about? If God did not spare his own son but delivered him over for us, what are we worried about? Will he not take care of the lesser things. Father, encourage us in your love. Uh, Make us humbly grateful for it. Help us, Lord, frankly, to treasure it above everything else in this universe. More than the cosmos, more than the riches of this world, more than friends and even family. Help us to treasure that which is most worthy to be treasured and God's sovereign love for his own. And we pray these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Would you join me as we stand together for the benediction? My brothers and sisters, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. 
May the Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Amen.